Hello, everyone. Welcome back to this week's Algebraic Graph Theory Seminar. This week, uh, Harmony is going to give us an introduction to discrete quantum walks. Thanks, Ina. So before I start, um, I want to list some references here. Uh, most of the talk today will be based on the joint book I wrote with Chris. Uh, this is already accepted by Cambridge University Press. and It will come out next March, hopefully. Yeah. But uh, there are some parts of the talk that are based on more recent papers I wrote uh, myself, as well as based Ada. So if this talk gets you interested in discrete quantum works, here are some references with more details that you can check. Okay. Um, so my talk will consist of three parts. First, I will show you how to quantize a random work. You will see that a naive approach fails, so we will end up with something less natural. Okay, and then we will study the spectral decomposition of this less natural transition matrix, and the goal is to associate that with something we are familiar with. Okay, finally, with this correspondence, we will study some interesting applications of quantum works, like perfect and pretty good state transfer and quantum work search. Okay, so part one, um, consider a classical random walk on P5. So I'm gonna put my random walker, let's say here. Okay. So with probability one, I will see the walker at the center vertex and zero elsewhere. Okay, this is the first state. So we have a probability distribution over the five vertices. Now the walker starts moving. So she tosses coin and decides if she wants to move left or right. And suppose the coin is fair, then with 50% chance, she's gonna move here. And 50 so after the uh, new probability distribution will be zero, half, zero, half, and zero. Okay. Now we see two copies of her. And in the next step, she's gonna move, like both copies will move simultaneously. So there will be a quarter probability where we saw her here, that comes from vertex one, and a quarter here from this vertex. And finally, a 50% chance that she will be in the middle that comes from both two, one and three. Okay, this process continues. In general, at time t, we will get a probability distribution uh, stony by a row vector xt in r to the fifth. And uh, um, the way we update this step, step is to multiply it by this stochastic matrix. Okay, so let's call this M. Okay, this is the weighted adjacency matrix of the past. And in each row, you are uh, evenly distributing the probability over the neighbors of the row index. So you can check xt plus one is equal to xt times m. So that is the random work on the path. Now, how do we quantize this work? Well, there are two axioms in quantum physics that we have to obey. The first one is every state must be a unit vector. Okay? And second axiom is the evolution of the quantum system must be unitary operator. So, uh, now, if we one by one to replace the probability distribution by a unit vector in this complex vector space. Okay, so that's fine. But the next step, um, we also want to replace the stochastic weighting of the adjacency matrix by a unitary weighting. So something like this. But now there is immediate problem because if this matrix were unitary, then column one, and column three will be orthogonal to each other, meaning that this is zero or this is zero. Then the underlying graph of this matrix is no longer the path of five vertices. So the naive approach fails because there's no unitary weighting of the reason matrix of P5. Fortunately, there is a way to construct a work that respects both the quantum axioms and the adjacency matrix. And the trick is to work on the arcs instead. 
So replace every edge of the path by a pair of opposite arcs. In this way, we get eight arcs. And we will let the state be the unit vector indexed by these eight arcs. Okay. Now, how do we respect the adjacency? Well, um, if we are on an arc going from A to B, okay, then in the next step, we are only allowed to move to an arc that leaves the head of the previous step. So we can only be either two, three, or two, one. Okay. In other words, we want a unitary matrix that looks something like this. It's indexed by the eight arcs. And in the first row, okay, in the first row, you only send down zero entry in the column leaving one. And in the second row, row of one zero, you only see now zero entries in the zero one column. And in the third row, you only see now zero entries in the two one and two three columns and so on. And you can check, we can actually make this unitary. For example, I can put one over here okay, and one over row two here, 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 and negative one over two there, and so on. So when you see two stars, you do one over root two or minus one over root two. And if you see just one star in the column, you put a one. Okay. So the matrix that we just constructed is actually a weighted adjacency matrix of the so-called light by graph of P5. So this is the graph where the vertices are the arcs of my original graph. Okay, and vertex AB is adjacent to vertex CB if the head of the previous arc is equal to the tail of this new arc. So of course, this adjacency won't be so light digraph is a digraph, not a graph, but it does have a unitary weighting as we have seen before. Okay, so the question is, if my graph gets more complicated, is there a systematic way to assign the weights so that U is unitary? So uh, if you think about the classical random walk, actually at each step, the worker does two things. First, she flips a coin and then she moves according to the coin. So here we will also think of each step of quantum walk as two steps, a coin flip followed by a shift. Okay, so the coin matrix, um, it, it changes the tail. So let's say my current arc is this, going from one to two. It changes the tail, but it keeps, sorry, it changes the head, but it keeps the tail. So if originally I'm at arc one, two, then after the coin toss, I will be in a linear combination of only the arcs leaving one. So I could be here with some weights, or I could be here, one, zero. But I cannot be anywhere else. Okay. The shift matrix, on the other hand, it does change the tail, but unlike coin matrix, it doesn't send an arc to a linear combination of an arc. Actually, it is a permutation matrix that maps each arc to only one of its adjacent arcs. So for example, you could map one, two to the opposite arc to one. Or you can map one, two to two, three, that, but you have to make the choice to make this matrix permutation. Now, let's see an example of the coin matrix and the shift matrix. On the path of five vertices, we can partition all the arcs according to their tails. So this is one group, second group, third group, fourth group, and the last group. Now, relative to this partition, the coin matrix is block diagonal. It has to act locally on the outgoing arcs of the same vertex, okay? And then we just assign the two by two harder matrix to all blocks of size two and assign one to all blocks of size one. Because each block is unitary, the resulting matrix will also be unitary. Now you see from the definition, we are free to choose uh, different blocks. So instead of having this harder matrices, we can take any two by two matrix as long as it's unitary. And the result you see will still be uh, a valid unitary coin matrix. And the choice of S is also not unique, but um, 
here it's easier to make a decision. So as we said before, we can just send every arc to its opposite arc. The resulting matrix is called arc reversal matrix. And in this particular example, it's also block diagonal. So you partition the arcs um, based on which edge they represent. Okay, so this is again block diagonal and every block is just a two by two permutation matrix. Every permutation matrix is unitary, so we are fine. Now let's put these two together. As a product of two unitary matrices, U is also unitary. And this is what it looks like. If you remember um, the weighting we had a few pages ago, you will see this is exactly a unitary adjacency matrix of the light diagraph of P5, where you had one over root two in, um, for the arcs of of degree two and one for the arcs of of degree one. Okay, now let's generalize the idea to any graph. Um, take on directive graph. Uh, the state at time t will be a unit vector in this complex vector space or the complex value function on the arcs. Okay. And the transition matrix will be a unitary weighting of the light diagraph of x. Now to use standard techniques in linear algebra, um, I will make a slight change here. So instead of viewing xt as a row vector, I will view it as a column vector and pre-multiply x by u. Okay, so in a sense, the worker is moving backwards, but that doesn't affect the other properties of the, of the quantum work. Okay, what if we perform a measurement at time t? The result of the measurement will be a particular arc AB, and this is the probability that we observe this arc. So here EAB is the um, characteristic vector of the arc. So it's indexed by the arc, and it's one in the AB entry, and zero otherwise. Okay, so this inner product simply extracts the AB entry of the state. And because the state is unitary, um, the squared modulus of every entry is between zero and one, and they sum to one. So we can view this Shaw product. So XT, Shaw XT complement. We can view this as a probability distribution. And uh, the AB entry of this is just the squared modulus. And there will be the probability of C in the arc AB. Sometimes we will also talk about probability at a vertex. And uh, this is just the sum of the above entry over our neighbors of A. So if A has three outgoing arcs, then you compute the probability that we are at this arc, this arc, and this arc, and then sum them up. So uh, let me go back to the past example and show you the states step by step. Originally, I put my uh, quantum worker here. So the initial state will be a characteristic vector of the arc two, three. And then we toss a coin and shift. Because we are working backwards, now the next step will be a linear combination of the incoming arcs of the tail of the previous state. So it be a linear combination of one into two, three into two. Okay, next step, we will move to arcs going into the tails three and one. So next step, at zero, one, two, one, and two, three, and four, three. Okay, step three, we will move to incoming arcs of zero of two, uh, there's nothing here, and of four. Okay, and in step four, we are going back to the incoming arcs of one and three. These are of one, uh, these are of three, and this process continues. Now, if we take the squared modulus of each number here, we will get probability. And uh, uh, in addition to the numbers, I also use some shades under them uh, to indicate the probability. So the darker the shade, the higher the probability that we'll see the worker here. So 
Initially, we are at arc 23 with certainty. And if we let the work run for one step and do a measurement, then with equal chance, we'll see the worker here or here. Okay. And the next step, uh, it spreads to four arcs with equal probabilities. In step three, um, we move to three arcs, but one of them has a higher chance than the others. Okay, so at this stage, the symmetry is already broken. And then in step four is even more interesting because we seem to prefer this arc to one a lot than the others. And it doesn't seem to happen a lot in the uh, classical random work, especially when T gets larger. So to make a fair comparison here, I will consider the probability distribution over the vertices for classical work and quantum work. Okay, so in both of the works, the worker starts from the central vertex. Okay, and because the graph is bipartite, um, the worker will move between color classes in even and odd steps. So that's the common uh, behavior for both classical quantum works, but there's also a difference. So as time goes by, in the classical random work, um, the probability distribution gets more and more evenly distributed inside one color class. But for the quantum work, you will see even after many steps, we can still observe the worker at a particular position with close to one probability. So why does that happen? And here are some other questions we can ask about the work. The first one is about instantaneous probabilities. So um, given an initial state and a target state Y, we can ask if there is a time T so that the state at time T is very close to my target vector. So um, in quantum system, the global phase is not observable. So um, we have to consider any possible scaling of Y where gamma is a unimodular complex number. But anyway, if this difference is equal to zero, then we say there is a perfect state transfer from X naught to Y. If this difference can be arbitrarily small, given that we waited long enough time, then we say there's a pretty good state transfer from X naught to Y. And I will talk about these two properties later in this talk. Um, we can also consider the limiting behavior of the quantum work. So in a classical random work, the state will converge to a stationary distribution as T goes to infinity, um, given the, the graph is not bipartite. Uh, but this is no case for the quantum work because U is unitary. So it preserves the distance between two consecutive states. That means neither the state nor the probability distribution will converge as D goes to infinity. However, by a Grotic theorem, we know the Cesaro sum, which is the, um, the average over the first T steps will converge as the time period T goes to infinity. So you can ask questions like, when is this limited distribution uniform over all the vertices? Okay. Um, finally, there's questions relating uh, discrete quantum works to continuous quantum works. So we know every unitary matrix can be written as the exponential of a skew Hermitian matrix, IH, or H is Hermitian. Um, so in this way, we can interpret you as a transition matrix of some weighted graph whose weighted adjacency matrix is equal to H. Now the question is, how is the underlying graph of H related to X? And is there any interesting relation um, if we choose the right H here? Okay, so those are all the questions you can ask. But um, if we want to do some serious analysis, we cannot avoid talking about the spectral decomposition of the transition matrix. So here, um, let alpha be the distinct eigenvalues of u. We know they must lie on the unit circle, so they have absolute value one, okay? And for each alpha, we let fr be the orthogonal projection onto the corresponding eigenspace. Now, u is unitarily diagonalizable. That's equivalent to saying we have a spectral decomposition of u in this form. It's a sum of alpha r times fr over all distinct eigenvalues r. 
Now, once we have this expression, um, it will be much easier to compute the quantity we're interested in the previous slides. So for the instantaneous behavior, we want to know what happens when we take the t's power of u. But that's just taking the t's powers of the uh, eigenvalues and append it with the um, eigenprojections. So this part is much cheaper than taking powers of a big matrix. For the limiting behavior, we also have an expression of this limit in terms of the spectral decomposition. Actually, all we need is the eigen projections and the initial state. And if you want to do some computation, your computer will thank you for feeding it this expression rather than that huge limit expression. Okay, and finally, the logarithm of u can also be obtained from the logarithm of the eigenvalues. So knowing this really helps with um, analyzing all those behaviors. Okay. So that was part one about quantizing quantum works. Um, is there any question at this point? Okay. <laughs> now um, we will try to diagonalize you. Okay. So when I first faced this problem, I had two reactions. My first reaction is these transition matrices are really huge. Even on a small graph like K5, okay, uh, K K5, um, the transition matrix we have will be 20 by 20 matrix, and that's really large. So how do we deal with it? And my second reaction is um, we have a lot of freedom to choose the coin matrix, right? So even if I work out the eigenvalues of U, how are they related to the underlying graph? That's not clear at all because it may be uh, determined by the coin matrix as well. So fortunately, many times we have a nice quantum work where uh, the previous question can be answered using a much smaller matrix. So this is the case where U is a product of two refractions, meaning both S and C are involutions and uh, Hermitian matrices. So for example, the arc reversal matrix uh, swaps arc AB with BA. So of course the matrix will be an involution and it also be symmetric. Now, um, for the coin matrix, previously we assigned this um, Hadamard coin to degree two vertices. You can check this is also symmetric of order two. But for vertices of a larger degree, we can assign the global coin, which is two over k j minus one, k being the degree. So here is an example where k is equal to three. This is also a refraction because we have um, j, this is all one's matrix, j over k is a projection um, onto the span of this all one spectrum. Uh, we know twice the projection minus the identity is a refraction. So for any k, that global coin will always satisfy this assumption as well. Okay. So how does that help with the diagonalization? Well, if S and C are involutions, then U lies in the dihedral group generated by S and C. And by some representation theory, you will see the state space is a direct sum of the RC, sorry, that's not R, it should be an S, okay. SC invariant subspace, each of them with dimension one or two. So now you can diagonalize you into these invariant subspaces. Okay. The one dimensional invariant subspaces are precisely the common eigenvectors of S and C, but S and C are evolutions, so their eigenvalues are plus one or minus one. So that means um, all these one dimensional invariant subspaces will give us real eigenvalues of U. So one minus one. Okay. How about the two dimensional subspaces? Well, if you diagonalize U restricted to those subspaces, then you will see a two by two matrix and its eigenvalues will be not real and they come in conjugate pair. And to be more precise, now let's write the refraction matrix C as twice a projection minus the identity. Okay. Because the projection is a uh, positive semi-definite, we can expand it as n, n star, where n has also normal columns. Okay. Now, consider this matrix n star as n. 
uh, by interlacing, this matrix will have eigenvalues between the minimum and maximum eigenvalue of S, which is minus one, one. So um, we can represent the eigenvalue of this permission matrix as cosine theta for some real number theta. And the magic here is that every eigenvalue of this permission matrix will get us two eigenvalues of U. Um, that is the, the numbers on the unit circle whose real part are cosine theta. Okay. But um, the advantage of this expression is that usually n is a tall thin matrix. So it will look something like this and it has much fewer columns than the rows. So when you print and multiply, post multiply s by n star and n, you will get a much smaller matrix. And uh, this theorem just says, the majority of the eigenvalues of U is determined by this smaller permission adjacency matrix of some weighted graph. Okay, so for example, if X is K regular, okay, and let's say I, I put the global coin everywhere. So the coin matrix looks something like two over K J minus I here, J minus I there, and so on. Oops. If we have n vertices, you will see n blocks here. Okay. Now this can be rewritten as two over k and a bunch of j's on the diagonal minus a big identity matrix. Okay. Now we want to write this projection as n n star, and that is easy. You just expand this as the outer product of this matrix. So you will again have n blocks. And now in each block, instead of putting the all ones matrix, we put the all ones vector. And then you take transpose of this matrix. That will be our n. Now, what is this matrix? It's actually an incidence matrix between the arcs and the vertices. So the rows of the matrix are the arcs of the graph. And because we have n columns, each column will correspond to one vertex. And you are going to see a one in the column, um, even only if the column index is the tail of the row index. So in other words, this matrix is the arc tail incidence matrix of the graph. It has a nice combinatorial meaning. Okay, now let's recall part two of the previous uh, theorem. The eigenvalues of you are are mostly determined by this Hermitian matrix. So if you do that multiplication, you will see uh, that's a scalar multiple of this tail arc incidence matrix times the arc reversal matrix times the transpose of the tail arc incidence matrix. But now what does S do to DT? Well, S swaps the tail with the head. So the product of S with DT transpose is equal to the arc head incidence matrix. So now let's look at the entries of this product. The UV entry is equal to one exactly when U is the tail of an arc and V is the head of the same arc. Okay, so this guy is equal to one even only if this happens, even only if U is adjacent to V. So this product turns out to be just the adjacency matrix of my underlying graph. So to give you an idea how much we have reduced the problem, here is the example on, five, on six vertices. Uh, it's a three regular graph. So the transition matrix is 18 by 18. But what we just showed is that the eigenvalues of U are either one or minus one, or the complex numbers uh, whose uh, real parts come from the eigenvalue of this small six by six adjacent matrix. And you can also leave the eigenvectors of A to eigenvectors of U. Okay, now the reason why the global coins translates into a constant weighting of the edges of graph is because this each block is a reflection about the constant vector. So this is a reflection about the O1 vector of size K, K being the valency. But we don't have to stick to that constant vector. We can take a reflection about something like 
I11. Okay, so this expands to I11 times minus I11. So now if you compute this matrix N star SN, you will see that um, in the entry zero one, we have a different weighting. Okay, so this arc is weighted I and the opposite arc is weighted minus I, while all the other edges will still receive the same weight one. Okay. So the transition matrix with this coin, its spectrum is largely determined by the Hermitian matrix of this um, mixed graph. Okay. What if we take the negative global coin at the vertex zero? Okay, now this guy will be a reflection about not the O1 spectra, but it's orthogonal complement. So it's a refraction about one perp, okay? Which now has dimension K minus one, again, K being the valency. So that means there will be more columns in N star than previous case. And in terms of the graphs, we want to duplicate the, the vertex zero, okay? Um, K minus one times. And what are the weights we put on these six edges? Well, whatever we put, they have to form an also normal basis for the orthogonal complement of all one factor. So one way to do so is to uh, take the three by three Fourier matrix. Okay, so it has one on one in the first column. And if theta is the third row of unity, you will have one theta theta squared and then one theta square. Theta. Okay. Now I can put the second column, the, the, the numbers there as the weights of arcs from zero to one. I can assign the weights from this column to the duplicated arcs. Okay. Of course, these are directed. Uh, and for the opposite direction, you just take the complex conjugate and that will again give you a Hermitian adjacency matrix. In short, the spectrum of the transition matrix with this coin matrix is determined by uh, the spectrum of the Hermitian matrix of the weighted uh, augmented graph. Okay, finally, we can also assign minus identity to a special vertex. Now this will be a reflection about the zero space. So that means the top row and top column of N star S N will be zero. In other words, the graph we are interested in will be the vertex deleted subgraph and the spectrum of U can be lifted from the spectrum of this graph. So, There was some connection between um, U and uh, uh, weighted the JCC matrix of the underlying graphs. Now I'm gonna apply that to um, behaviors like perfect state transfer and quantum search. Um, for now, we will assume the graph is K-regular on N vertices, uh, but some of our analysis will also apply to irregular graphs. The first behavior we're interested in is perfect state transfer. So consider a regular graph and two vertices in U and V. We want to start with a state that concentrate on U. What I mean by that is X naught is supported only by the outgoing arcs of U. So it looks something like this. Okay, the question is, is there a time so that XT is supported only by the outgoing arcs of V? If that happens, then there's PSD from vertex U to vertex V. So here um, I specify the linear combination to be uniform for, for the outgoing arcs of U, but I don't care what I assign here. As long as the probability of the other arcs are zero, I'm fine. Okay, so let's formalize this problem. Assign the global coin to every vertex because the graph is regular, I can do so. And uh, we have seen that the spectrum of U reduces to spectrum of this matrix, which is just the uh, one over k of the JCC matrix of the graph. 
Okay. And suppose this is the spectral decomposition of A, so lambda is the eigenvalue, and E lambda is the orthogonal projection onto its eigenspace. Then we have a characterization of pervasive transfer um, using just the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A. So we need to check two conditions. The first condition is about the eigenspaces. So U and V must be what we call strongly co-spectral. That is the projection of EU and EV uh, onto the same eigenspace must be plus minus one of each other. And the reason why it's called strongly co-spectral is because it's, it's stronger than being co-spectral. So this is equivalent to two things. First, the graph uh, U and V are co-spectral. So the UU entry equals the VV entry for any lambda. And secondly, these two vectors must be parallel. Now, the first condition already has a lot of combinatorial interpretation. For example, um, the number of close work at U of length L must be equal to the number of close work um, at, at V of the same length. So if you see U and V have different degrees, or uh, one of them is contained in the triangle, but the other isn't, then we can immediately rule out PST from U to V. Okay, next, once we have this relation, we can partition the eigenvalues of graph into three classes. Class one, the lambdas for which both vectors are equal to zero. Class two, the lambdas for which this is positive of this. And class three, the lambdas so that E lambda U is negative of E lambda EV. Okay, and let's call them uh, the plus and minus set. So for the, all the eigenvalues in the plus set, we want them to be exactly equal to cosine of j pi over t. t is and j is any integer. Okay. And for all the eigenvalues in the minus set, we want lambda to be equal to cosine of the same thing, but this time j must be an odd integer. So if you are strongly co-spectral, the plus eigenvalues takes this form, and the minus eigenvalue take this form, then there is PST from U to V at time T. Okay, this gives us a very concrete direction to look for perfect state transfer. So first we want to start with graphs whose eigenvalues does take this form, right? So where should we look for? An obvious place will be the KD graphs or abelian groups. So take an abelian groups G and take a subset C, which is inverse closed and doesn't contain the identity then the KD graph XGC will be the graph whose vertices are group elements in G. And um, a group element U is adjacent to another element V if the difference between them lies in C. Because C is inverse closed, the uh, KD graph will actually be a graph. Okay, now for abelian groups, the characters will form a group isomorphic to G and uh, uh, they are pairwise orthogonal, and each of them is actually an eigenvector for the adjacency matrix of the graph. Moreover, the corresponding eigenvalue will be the sum of psi of G as G runs over all elements in the connection set. Okay, so if, for example, if G is or integers modulo n, then the KD graph is called the circular graph. Okay. And there will be n characters, each of them sends the group elements to some n rules of unity. So to be more precise, the j's character sends g to e to the two pi i over n times j times g. Okay, so now the eigenvalues will be just the sum of rules of unity. And because g is inverse closed, um, you will see this guy and it's conjugate. So, so um, the real part will be two cosine of this. So using that machinery, we find out an infinite families of circular graphs that have perfect state transfer. And these are uh, KD graphs over Z2L where L is odd. And uh, there are four generators in the connection set. So plus minus A, and plus minus L minus A. So for any choice, uh, not zero, choice of A, um, you will get an uh, example with PST. 
And we can also relax a little bit and consider the pretty good state transfer. Here we have the same initial step, but um, instead of requiring the final state to be exactly equal to this, we, we allow it to be supported by, by more than these arcs, but the probability where all the other arcs must be small enough. Actually, we want to make it as small as possible given long enough time t. So if for any epsilon greater than zero, there's t such that this guy is epsilon close to the state that are only supported by these four arcs, then we see there is a pretty good state transfer from u to v. And again, we have a characterization in terms of the eigenvalues of A as well. So PGSD happens if and only if U and V are still strongly co-spectral. So you can partition the eigenvalues into the zero set, the plus set, and minus set. And now for all the eigenvalues in the plus and minus set, we want their arc cosines to be somewhat linearly independent over the rationals. This is a result of the Kronecker's approximation theorem. The actual statement is a bit tedious to write out, but I will show you what it means using one example. So on the hypercube of degree five, the antipolar vertices are strongly co-spectral, as you can check, and the eigenvalues will be partitioned into these two groups. Now, PGSD happens if and only if the following implement, implication is true. So the hypothesis of the implication is that some linear combination, some integer linear combination of these R cosines is divisible by two pi. And these are the um, coefficients in, in the linear combination, okay. And if that happens, we want this conclusion to be true. So the sum of the coefficients over the minus set, so those over here must be even. Requires that, then PGS happens. Now the problem is how do we deal with this um, complicated expression? We now need some tools from number theory. Notice that all these numbers are angles whose cosines are rational numbers. So they are purely geodetic angles. And what does that mean? Well, a number is purely geodetic if the square of one of these six trigonometric numbers is either rational or infinite. And there is a beautiful result by Conway and colleagues about the integer linear combination of purely geodetic angles that says, if you have a rational linear combination, so C1, angle one, C2, angle two, C4, angle four, and so on. If this is divisible by pi, so complement to zero mod pi, okay? Then you can group the angles according to their tangents. So inside each group, um, the tangent of these angles have the same square free part. Okay. After you do the partition, um, the theorem says this sum will also be divisible by pi. This sum will also be divisible by, and so on. So the value of the restriction of this linear combination to those angles whose tangents are rational multiples of any given square root will also be a rational multiple of pi. Um, so in this way, we have reduced a long congruence relation to a bunch of short congruence relations that must hold simultaneously. Okay. So if you go back to the previous example, those two angles will have the same tangent and those two angles will have the same tangent but a different square free part than this one. And this will be equal to zero, so it doesn't matter. This will be pi, okay? So essentially you have just three groups and we can use linear independence to check um, to impose some conditions on, on these cells. So after some manipulation, you will see that ah, we do have the sum of these five numbers over the minus set is an even number, okay? And with the same idea, you can show that for any hypercube on a prime um, and two to the prime number of vertices, um, there is pretty good state transfer between the antipolar vertices. Okay, how about the limiting behavior? Well, here we have two questions to answer. They are kind of flow to each other. The first question is, if I start with the state that's uniform over the vertices, can we reach a state that concentrate one vertex in the average state? Okay. 
So this is related to the search problem. Here, we're gonna make one vertex special and assign a different coin to it than the others. So suppose everybody else gets the global coin, okay? And this special vertex gets the minus G coin, okay? Then the question is, if we start with a uniform linear combination of all outgoing arcs, then in the limiting distribution, how likely are we gonna end up with uh, a state that only um, concentrate on this vertex A. So can we find that target vertex A in the limited distribution? So let's make it more formal. Um, X node is this uh, constant vector and the coins are minus Grover at vertex A and Grover at the other vertices. We have seen that the spectrum of U reduces to the Hermitian Dresden matrix of some augmented graph where you duplicate these special vertices K minus one times. And define the average search probability to be the following. You take the probability distribution in the limit, okay? And sum over all the probabilities on the outgoing arcs of A. This will give you the probability that on average, the quantum work is in um, the particular vertex A, okay? Now, you may think this number will depend on the parameters of the graph, and maybe as the graph gets larger, it will vanish. It's not true. So for these times regular graphs, um, with intersection array bi's and ci's. Uh, let's sub suppose we have family where these parameters depends on another parameter tau. So in particular, the valency of the graph will also depend on the uh, parameter tau. And suppose the limit of this ratio goes to zero as tau goes to infinity. Then it turns out that every search probability will approach to something constant, even if the graph gets very large, and this constant is a quarter. So in particular, all complete graphs will have success probability around one quarter, or strongly regular graph will have the same success probability. And for uh, larger distance regular graphs, if we require just this ratio, so a valency um, size ratio to coverage to zero, then we will have the same probability as well. So they will cover many examples, including uh, Hamming graphs with a fixed diameter and Johnson graphs with a fixed diameter. So many families of DRGs, they have a very high chance of finding the marked vertex in the limit. Okay, so in some sense, this supports uh, the idea that a quantum search is fast on distance trivial graphs. Okay, and the other uh, property we can consider is kind of the opposite. So now I want to start with the vertex okay, and end up with something that's uniform over all the vertices. And um, this phenomenon is not hard to see in classical random walks. However, um, in the quantum walk where you cite all Grover coins, it's, it, it never happens. Okay, so what I mean is if you put G everywhere, okay, then in the limited distribution, you will always be at the original vertex with slightly higher probability than the others. But fortunately, we are free to choose a different initial state. It doesn't have to stay with the old ones. It can be some other weighted version. And then I can also put some weighted Grover coin in my coin matrix. And with that help, um, we, we, can, we can engineer the phenomenon. So again, let's consider a billion KD graph. And we are gonna assign to each element in the connection set a complex weight WG so that the weight G receives is different from the weight minus G received. Okay. Now, um, this defines a bunch of Ws and they will form a vector of length K. So now consider the weighted global coin where um, the, this is a projection onto the column space of, of W. Um, then we know the N star S will be a Hermitian residency of the weighted graph. And if I start with the outgoing arcs where um, weight on the arc AB is equal to WB minus A and define the probability distribution the same as before, then it turns out for the uniform distribution to happen, uh, a sufficient condition is that this matrix has simple eigenvalues. 
Okay, so simple eigenvalues implies uniform distribution over all the vertices. And turns out for almost all weightings we assign to the connection set, this guy will have simple eigenvalue. So you just randomly throw weights at the connection set and then uh, the limiting distribution will be uniform over the vertices. All you need to do is to avoid WG equals G. And this, this part explains why the Jigsaw matrix doesn't work because you are assigning one to all the connection sets. So it violates this condition, but uh, most of weight will work. Okay, uh, finally, I just want to talk a little bit about the relation between uh, continuous and discrete quantum works. So here is a K4, and we can construct an arc reversal work with global coins. Let's call UK4 the, the, the transition matrix. Now let's square it. This is unitary, so it's equal to the exponential of I times some Hermitian matrix. But the Hermitian matrix has a very nice combinatorial interpretation. It's a scalar multiple of the skewed adjacent matrix of the light eye graph of K4. Okay, so the skewed adjacent matrix is just A minus A transpose. Okay. In other words, a discrete quantum work on K4 can be simulated using a continuous quantum work on its light eye graph. Now the question is how far can we push this um, conclusion to other graphs? Well, we can always factor U squared into a bunch of continuous quantum works. The problem is uh, for what graph will the underlying graph of the continuous quantum works be related to X in an interesting way? Well, again, the distance regular graph will give a nice answer. So let X be a distance regular graph of the energy D with an invertible adjacency matrix. Let's again assign the global coin to every vertex. Then U squared factors into at most D continuous quantum works. Each of them is a quantum work on the I's distance diagraph of the line diagraph of X. So any strongly at most two terms. And uh, <coughs> that's an interesting connection. Okay, so at the end of talk, I just want to quickly mention some uh, open problems here. Um, for those of you who are familiar with continuous quantum works, you probably have seen statements like uh, the only paths with adjacency perfect state transfer are P2 and P3, and the only trees with Laplace in perfect state transfer is P2. Okay. But those statements, um, they do not appear in, in literature of these quantum works yet. So we don't have any families which we can say, um, these are the only graphs in the family that has PST and PGST. Okay. So a starting point for the problem is maybe to complete the analysis for hypercubes. We already know that QP has perfect state, sorry, pretty good state transfer is P is a prime. So what happens if P is a composite? Maybe some more number theory will be uh, needed here. Okay, and that brings us to the next question. So how about PST on trees? Well, those are radical graphs and uh, um, so far our analysis applies mostly to, to regular graphs. So um, in order to characterize some phenomenon on trees or maybe just paths, um, maybe we should understand the quantum works on irregular graphs as well. So if you apply global coins with size K to a degree K vertex, then the resulting transition matrix will, its spectrum will be determined by the normalized adjacency matrix of the graph. And three, we have seen how to engineer quantum work to have uniform average probability distribution over the vertices, but what about the other distributions? For example, can we choose the weight so the distribution is proportional to the degrees of the vertices? That I don't know at all. And um, can we choose the weight to boost the returning probability in the limit? Okay, so for distance regular graph, again, we have some partial results. If I use minus i for the special vertices and mark, then um, this average probability will converge to one eighth for families of bipartite DRGs, and it will converge something even higher for non bipartite graphs. So a question here is asked, can we choose a different uh, special coin to make this limit even higher? Okay, and finally, uh, we still don't know what is the log result of u squared if uh, some of the vertices are marked. So 
can use graph factor into continuous quantum works whose underlying diagrams are related to the vertex deleted subgraph of X? I don't know. But if that is answered, then um, in theory, you have a way to implement the quantum search algorithms using continuous quantum works. And then we may uh, be able to use the theory in quantum works in continuous quantum works to prove search is, let's say, optimal or some class of graphs. Okay, so that's all the problems I want to talk about. Thank you for your attention. So is there any question for Harmony? Hello, can I have a question? Uh, sure. Yes, please. Hi, very nice, very nice talk. I'm sorry I couldn't catch the, the beginning. Uh, but um, is the can you can you extend the uh, the approach or the theory to the case when the graphs would have uh, loops? Um, yes, certainly you can do that. Mm -hmm. So um, right now, assuming the graph has no loops, so this transition matrix will be indexed by the arcs, right? But if you have a loop, uh, then you 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 can have an arc pointing from A to A. Mm -hmm. So um, the theory, you can still extend it. Uh, okay, so let me go to the right page where I have this N matrix. Um, right over here. So if the graph is K-regular with some loops, then um, you will also have an incidence matrix between tails and the arcs. So what you mm -hmm. do is just to augment each row to allow the loop at, at that particular vertex and still put one here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So Be actually you can quantize any lazy random work where yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, essentially there's loops everywhere, right? Yeah, Be because that yeah. was one way, uh, I think Thomas introduced that, Thomas Wong, how to increase the, the success probability of say search that you have awaited loops because yes. without the loops like typically say the graphs are i don't know bipartite or so and this the probability to find the marked vertex it like goes between zero and and something mm -hmm. and it like builds up but but it oscillates and when you have yeah. a loop it builds up on the loop so so that kind of smooths is way and also boosts typically the the success probability and I think there is a proof that it works for some. You can you can choose a proper way to to get close to zero, for, I think a distance regular graphs. But I think the proof mm -hmm. uh, uses a mapping to the Shegedi model, and it's kind of abstract. So I I, I got lost in. <laughs> oh, that, that that's that's a very good point. Yes, I think uh, if you allow the loops and the um, if you manipulate the, the weights on the loops, then yes, I think the probability will be even higher. And we mm. can probably apply that idea to the search problem. So yep. this, yeah. yeah, this thing, maybe it can be even higher than one quarter and one eighth. But yeah, that's an interesting point that you mm -hmm. brought up and I would be interested in learning that. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, about the, the state transfer. So, uh, because like, I, I think you mostly uh, had the case where you have like the Grover coin everywhere. Mm -hmm. and you do state transfer from a vertex to a vertex. How about like essentially modifying the search for a, for a state transfer? So like I have mm -hmm. two marked vertices and I start from one to the, and I go to the other marked vertex. So is it possible to analyze it in this way on some yeah, broader, broader uh, range of graphs? Because like, this mm -hmm. is what we are doing with, with my PhD students, Thundascopy. Oh. And we usually just like, you know, select some class of graphs and, and like show that there is a small invariant subspace and you reduce it to like a rotation in a, I don't know, three-dimensional, five-dimensional subspace. But like mm -hmm. telling something on, on like broader class of graphs, this seems to be very difficult. So yeah, I think I saw the paper you mentioned. So that was on the bipartite graphs, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, you you consider two cases. Either they are in the same cloud class or different yeah, cloud yeah. class, and the behavior is different. So yeah, I think that is possible, but we have to uh, again consider two different cases. So if you mark these two vertices, right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, when the vertices are very far from each other, in particular, they don't have 
uh, common neighbors, then essentially you are just deleting. So the spectrum of U will be the spectrum of the vertex deleted graph where you delete mm -hmm. those two corresponding vertices. But mm -hmm. if they are adjacent to each other or if they share some common neighbors, then um, you will be slightly more complicated. I guess this is what you mean when you do the complete bipartite graphs. Yeah, yeah. Because they much. will have, yeah. But um, it, it's doable, I think. Mm. You just need to I mean, it, it might be possible to do some kind of a perturbation theory because, like, you mm -hmm. have you can do the you can do the uh, you have the results for the case where you have the same coin everywhere, yeah. And then, like, modifying say coins at two vertices, this is like a finite, like a small perturbation. Mm. Um, but I don't know. Maybe maybe what something can be can be found this way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank Thanks. thank you very much. Um, is there any other question for Amelia? Amelia, has anyone looked at the uh, like the the, the three quantum work on uh, bi-regular graphs? Say the star, it's a tree and it's bi-regular. Um, actually, I think people have looked at this. So, okay, the, the question is also interesting. So you have a tree uh, joined by a bunch of stars. Okay, and then maybe in the middle you have some uh, degree two vertices. Now the question is, can you run a quantum walk to identify where what are the center vertices of the star? So now, you, of course, you have to use a different vector. So let's say uh, all the outgoing arcs you put them one there, and all the incoming arcs into the star you put a minus one. And this is another such problem. So can you start? Can you detect graph anom anomalies using that initial state? Yeah. So um, I don't know about the spectrum, but uh, I assume you have something to do with normalized adjacency matrix of the trees. Okay, so any other question for Harmony? I'm just am I audible? Hello? Oh. Hello? Uh, I don't know if it's no. my am I internet audible? or... Oh, okay. Uh, okay. No, no, no. I think your, your internet, uh, yeah, your voice is breaking. Of we cannot hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, right now. Yeah, I, I can just... hear you. Okay, so uh, my question is uh, periodicity in the both uh, kind of quantum work uh, have different meaning and uh, different definitions. Uh, mm -hmm. So is there any connection um, between uh, periodicity of uh, in in both a kind of uh, quantum work. Oh, so you mean periodicity in continuous quantum work and discrete quantum works? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so uh, the short answer is it's not clear, but they are both reduced to. Um, uh, the eigenvalue support of the graph. So, so the problem here is that, okay, so uh, let me go to maybe the PGST will be more uh, illustrative. So in the continuous quantum works, you will want the lambdas to be somewhat linearly independent over the rationals. But here we are talking about R cosine of lambda. So you can see if lambda, let's say is integers, then almost surely, um, well, if, if the vertices are periodic in the continuous quantum works, then the same number theoretic condition will not hold for the arc cosine of, of these integers. So um, in a strict sense, periodicity at this quantum work doesn't imply periodicity um, at the continuous quantum works, but there is still a relation between PST and the, and the periodicity. So in the arc reversal work where you put all the global coins, if PSD happens, that means both vertices U and vertices B are periodic. So um, what I'm saying is to, to identify vertices with PST, our first step is still to identify all those vertices that are periodic in the quantum work. And then we're uh, kind of pair this up to see if 
they can be PST. So this idea is similar um, as that in, in continuous quantum works. Uh, 